everybody. Welcome. We are so glad you have joined us tonight. This is our second time with our Faith in a World of Chaos interviews. Um, I am Allison Lanza. I'm one of the pastors at Ridgely Christian Church. Um, and this is our new series where we are taking time to look at what does it mean to be faithful people right now in a time when our world is filled with even more chaos than normal, in a time of pandemic, in a time when um, racism is seeming to speak louder and show up more often and more violently, in a time where everything is on its head, what does it mean to be faithful people right now? What are we called to be as the church right now? And so we at Ridgely Christian Church have decided each week on Wednesday evenings to interview some of the most faithful, most justice seeking, most creative people we know um, to see if they can help guide us in thinking about who the church is supposed to be right now. And so tonight we are thrilled to welcome Reverend Rebecca Crevins. Um, Becca is a pastor at Foothills Christian Church. Many of you at Ridgely might know her. She is Granny Ann, Ann Owen, and Quentin Owen's amazing granddaughter. She also, if you look at our bulletin, our order of worship each week, the amazing artwork that goes with our scripture for each week that's on the front of that, Becca paints for us each week and is a phenomenal artist and um, is really good at figuring out how ways to weave art into faith and art into the ways we live out our faith. And so I can't wait for you all to get to hear from her tonight and get to learn from her tonight. So welcome, Becca. We're so glad you're here. Thank you, Allison. It's so great to be here. I love Ridgely. Um, like you said, my grandparents have been longtime members and it's a church my mom grew up in. Um, it's a church that I always think about on Easter because growing up, that was always the Sunday that we would come visit our grandparents and um, worship in your sanctuary and take a picture with the flowering cross there with all the cousins. Um, but I'm also glad um, before I started my student associate while I was at Bright at Irving North Christian Church, um, before I began that, I was able to worship um, at Ridgely during my first year at Bright. So, oh, um, wonderful. I didn't know that. So glad to um, get to be part of your evening tonight. Thanks for being here. And um, those of you joining us on Zoom and those of you joining us on Facebook, um, how this will work is I have some questions we'll ask Becca, but if you have questions, if you have things you're curious about from her, um, type those in the chat box on Zoom or on Facebook Live comments and we'll make sure we get those to her as we go. But um, Becca, first I told a little bit, but if you wanna tell us a little bit more about who you are and what do you do in this world? Sure. So yeah, um, I'm a pastor at Foothills Christian Church. It's um, in North Phoenix here in Arizona where it's really hot today. I think the high was 108. Um, and I've been here for over five years. And um, it's a lovely congregation. We're open and affirming. And um, it's just a congregation I'm, I'm glad to be able to not only serve as a pastor of, but for my family to be a part of. Um, and it's a church that if I wasn't a pastor, if I was looking for a church in this community. It's the one I would um, want to be a part of. And um, I am married to a potter. My husband, Frank, he's a ceramic artist. And so we actually live on Potter Drive. That's just a coincidence. That's so cool. But, uh, I can do a little show and tell moment. I don't know yes. if you'll come through my window is this, the large kiln that takes up the majority of our backyard. And then um, his, awesome. his studio is part of and in our house as well. And it's the whole garage. Um, and then we have two daughters, Chloe and Phoebe, who are eight and six years old. And like you said, I am, am also an artist. I paint. Um, my husband and I, we are, we're very different in our, um, the medium we use, but that's how we met. We both met in college as art majors. Um, and I went straight from college to seminary and then into ministry. And so for about a decade, I went through a period of time where I wasn't creating at all. In the past year and a half is when I started to pick it back up as a regular practice. Wonderful. And I know art is one of the things you're passionate about. Do you want to tell us some of your other passions or more about your passion of art? Sure. Um, so some of the things I'm passionate, I would say, um, even though I'm not even if I wasn't doing this interview and it was just a question out in the world, 
I would say I'm most passionate about church. It's the thing that's shaped my life in significant ways as a child and now as a pastor. Um, I'm passionate about um, our calling as a church, but also um, things that I'm passionate about include plants. I love house plants. I think um, because I live in the desert, when I moved here, all I saw was brown and I tried to um, bring as much green into my life. And from there, it just kind of took over. And now every window ledge or any place there's sunlight in my house, it's taken over with plants. And now I like to propagate them and give them away. And um, it's just something I really love to learn more about. And it's my favorite little hobby. Um, something else I'm passionate about that um, I'm noticing that I'm missing is thrifting. Um, I normally go to the thrift store about four or five times a week. Like there's a thrift store between my house and the church and I'm known to stop by there every time I pass by. Um, so I've been really missing it, but it's been good to have a break. I know every day of the week, like what sale is which day and what color tag. Um, and I love just trying to find things. And um, so yeah, that's that, that artist eye that you have. The fun thing about me, but yeah, no, but the other thing is just art. Um, so painting is um, my favorite um, pastime. And I was an art major in college. And before that I had um, painted and um, took art lessons as a young kid. But then um, when I went to college, I knew I wanted to go to seminary and I thought I had to be a religious studies major to go to seminary. And then once I found out you didn't have to do that and you just needed a bachelor's in anything, I thought, well, I should, I wanted to enjoy this time. And so I decided to take up um, art as my major. And, um, but then I kind of never saw it as something I was going to pursue beyond that. I, um, but then as the years have gone by, it's still been something that's been lingering in my soul is wanting to create. And in a lot of ways, I liken it to um, describing my sense of call to ministry, that sense of call to create. And I used to see them as like two separate things that I had to choose one path or the other. And then this past year and a half, um, probably coincided when my children started becoming more independent mm -hmm. and became full age, um, kind of opened up some time and space in my life. And now I've been working at integrating these two calls um, and not seeing them as isolated, but how they can um, shape and inform one another. That's amazing. Where are you going these days for inspiration? I know, I don't know about you, for me, I've had a hard time finding inspiration these days, trying to parent and pastor all from home all the time. But what things are, are helping you kind of find your inspiration in your life these days? Stories in our scripture, or podcasts, or books, or shows? Yeah, so um, for scripture, I tend to be a lectionary based preacher and um, not out of a sense of obligation, like feeling like that's the only path I can take and my church expects me to follow the lectionary. Um, but I really like the discipline of it and it calls me to preach on texts I would not choose. And I'm surprised over and over and over again how timely the passage for that particular Sunday is for the week we're experiencing. Um, and so for instance, this last Sunday was, um, I preached on the text um, of Acts, which is about Jesus' ascension. And um, I found it really inspiring to think about how um, the followers of Jesus in that moment were really living in this in-between moment between the resurrection, but before Pentecost and thinking about how we're also in this very in-between time and time is so strange in this moment. Um, but so I would say lectionary for scripture. And then um, I am an avid podcast listener and I'm always trying to find new ones because I constantly um, um, listen through all of them and then need more to fill my time with. And so my administrative assistant at church, um, she is great at giving me um, recommendations. So I have some like ones I've listened to for a long time that are more storytelling based, like The Moth or This American Life, but a new one, I think it's relatively new, but it's also from public radio is Through Line. Oh, I don't know that one. It's, it's um, I really like that one. And then um, for inspiration, I would say I, I see a lot of parallels in the way um, lessons I've learned from art, from creativity. Hmm. Um, and I think this time we're living in right now 
um, as a pandemic and being self-isolating or and self practicing social distances, we notice a lot of um, limitations we have in our lives. But it, it's always during those times of limitation that creativity is born. Um, and so when this all started and I was just trying to figure out how to breathe and live and make my way through the day, um, I had tried to create try to the practice of painting every single day, hmm. um, carving out just a little bit of time, even if it's just 30 minutes or an hour. But when this all started, I'm like, nope, can't do that anymore. <laughs> I um, have to teach my children and work and do all these other things. But then I discovered just like anything, those times when we think we don't have time for something, it's always that thing that we don't think we have time for, that once we do start carving out space for it, it actually, is what we need. And so this past three weeks or so, I think is when I've started that again is practice painting every single week. Um, and so some lessons, I don't, this might be too long of an answer, but um, no, it's great. I always think about, so um, I, I like to think of painting as a metaphor almost for the way I live in life and ministry nowadays. Um, and so um, to me, whether you're drawing or painting, the thing that I feel like it boils down to is it's all about um, having to change the going from looking at things the way you think you see them to actually how you see them. Oh. Um, and so it's this exercise of, of really paying attention and looking um, in a way that, that I feel like similar to prayer. Um, it's a practice, practice of paying attention because our mind will tell us things that to, in order to make our way through the day, it constantly like categorizes or tries to make things more simple than they are. Um, but really it's just, that's deceptive. And you can see that in how people's um, drawings um, change over the, from being a toddler to a six year old to a 10 year old, like every child will draw a face, they'll start with a circle and then they'll put their eyes right up at the top because that's what your mind tells you is that the facial feature on the top of your face is your eyes. When really, when you draw a face and you actually look, eyes are in the very middle of your face. There's just as much face as above and below. Huh. And so constantly when you, when I come to paint or draw, it's a constant activity of undoing what I think I see and paying attention to what I really truly see. Um, so I think that's just kind of a good way to think about life too. Yeah. Um, and then um, the other thing is, um, so I tend to paint the, the more I paint, the more I'm trying to limit my palette, um, by only painting with the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, and then white, because from that, you can get every single color you need. Um, and so for life, you think it's, you, you have everything you need. You think sometimes, oh, I, I can't do this yet because I need this, this, and this to have that happen. But, um, as people of faith, we have everything we already need. Um, and so, um, and then the opposite is if I were to instead go out and buy every single color, those colors you're buying aren't the colors you need because if, when you're able to mix it, you're able to be, and um, pay attention and notice the blues in that color and the yellows in that color or the reds. Um, and almost every single color I mix has every single color in it. Um, because you learn like red and yellow make orange, but most oranges aren't orange. They are they have some blue in it that makes it a little grayer of an orange. Um, so yeah, so that, and then the other one I would say is um, the, the thing I'm learning through art is um, the importance of accountability. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know about you or other people, but I've had all these things that I always want to do or intend to do, but I only tell myself. And then I, after like day three, I stopped doing it. Um, and so the reason I think this streak of creating has um, prolonged as long as it has for the past year and a half is because I started telling people about it. Whereas before I would just hide it and keep it to myself because I didn't think it was good enough or I, I just was afraid. Um, and so there's so many things in our life that we, we are afraid or it keeps us from putting ourselves out there. But um, to me that parallels to um, the role of the church because when we're part of a church is about being a part of a community and being accountable. We could all just pray by ourselves and we wouldn't need a congregation to do that. But showing up 
every week we're being held accountable to a group of people and um, we're something more than what we could be alone. Um, so I think that's another takeaway um, from all this, this expanded me metaphor of art as life. We could just stop there. That's brilliant. And I think exactly what our, our world needs right now is to know that, I mean, I think part of what these last couple of months has shown our world is what you said in that first point, that what we thought we see might not be what actually is, right? And I think this time of social distancing and has shown us some of the stuff we thought was fine, we've started to see now where some of the breaks are and some of the holes are. And also we're finding beauty in things that we had ignored before. We're starting to see what's, what's real differently. And yeah. we have learned, I've learned more living alone about the accountability I need and the community I need than when I was with people all the time and I took it for granted or how yeah. I have everything what we need, what, you know, just as right. we are. Oh. So. Yeah, like, um, I love that what, how you said that because um, the the sadness and the tragedies and the um, things that are just so heartbreaking from this time of pandemic, um, I'm not someone who preaches about the apocalypse every single Sunday, mm -hmm. but I have really appreciated some people commenting, making and um, reflecting on about how this is an apocalyptic time because mm -hmm. apocalypse really means to reveal and to show what has always been the case. And so the, um, the, 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 the problems of our community of how some have a lot and some have not enough and um, the, how much people or kids that are hungry and really rely on the food they receive at school. All of these things were existing before the pandemic, but this pandemic reveals what's um, the brokenness of our humanity and our society. And the same way that, um, I don't know, so somebody, what's on my heart, which I'm sure is on many, is the news this past couple day yesterday of the story out of Minneapolis about the tragic um, loss of life from, and, and, um, and it, just thinking about how this keeps happening again and again. And I've heard people say like, why, why is this happening more now? But it's not happening more. Mm -hmm. It's just that there is this reveal, this unveiling because now there is this ability to capture footage because we have cameras in our pockets. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the that the, that there's so much still that we don't see because there aren't cameras in every situation. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think this is, has shown us both beauty that we had missed and lots of injustices that we had normalized that have now been made clear that, what a gift for the church though, right? Because now that they're made clear, now that we can see them with that artist eye, like you showed us, now we can do something about them. Um, now we can speak out about them to help make our world more like God's. You mentioned a little bit about, um, what the role of the church is, but what else do you kind of see is the role of the church today um, in this time? I think the church has something really particular and powerful that we can be and are being called to be, um, but it, we're still in that, like you said, that in-between of discerning what that is. Um, so what do, what do you think that is in this time, or at yeah. least today? <laughs> in a way, the role of the church is the same as it always has been, but now the role, um, but now maybe perhaps it can be on display in a way that it hasn't been before. The role of the church is um, to, um, I think that practicing or experiencing the open table of communion every Sunday and then going out into the world and looking about how to make our world more like that open table. Um, so to communities of transformation, um, but also, I'm, think, I'm thinking of how many people are experiencing this time as an experience of isolation. And so the church's role in providing belonging and community is paramount. Um, I think also the role of the church um, is to respond with the gifts we have to meet the needs of the critical needs around us. And um, now more than ever, there were needs before, but there are even greater needs now um, so to how to bring, um, help and hope to a world that could be hurting. Um, I think that's important ways to see it because I, a lot of conversation I'm hearing these days is how can we be the church differently? What do we do differently? And I think you're right. We're not, we're not maybe being called to do anything differently. Our call is just becoming clear. What we've always been called to, we can now see the power and the importance of, um, and maybe step out and do it in ways that, ways that are new, but the what we are doing is the same call. Right. What do you, 
sort of challenge do you have for, for us, for anyone who is thinking, I want to live as a faithful person today. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to follow God's call today to do these things we've always been called to. What word of challenge do you have for us? What do you see as our call? Um, I think in this moment of today, and this may have been different, you know, what I would, how I would have answered it a few days ago, but I think a word of challenge I have would be to um, sit, to sit in your own discomfort, um, mm -hmm. to find the gifts that will emerge from that place of discomfort. Um, because I think I've experienced that in this pandemic. It's definitely been not a comfortable one, but I've been, there's been things to gain from it. And um, today I'm thinking about sitting in the discomfort of racism and um, privilege the, out of the two stories that came, that I, and that came out yesterday of the one in Minneapolis versus the one in New York about out in Central Park. Um, the place of discomfort I have is sitting with the story in New York and seeing myself and the woman um, who, the white woman and um, seeing how I, um, have so much or the privilege I have with that I don't even recognize and also um the the part I play in that story and the things I need to learn and to continue to be discomforted by in order to challenge to risk being discomfortable because I think sometimes there's so much um I I have the privilege of just turning things off or not paying attention um but that we as people of faith are constantly called to um, transformation and to the work of wholeness. Yeah, and I think you're right that we find that's not going to be easy work and it's not going to happen um, quickly, but it's going to be a long, um, uncomfortable journey. Yeah, we're not just called to transform the world with God's love, but first we have to let God's love transform us, which means seeing seeing how we are a part of the sins of racism, seeing how we particularly as, you know, the two of us as white women have historically, white women have been a large part of what it, how racist and violent acts happen in our country. And to lay claim to that, that we are a part of that and then to be transformed to how we can shift. I think, I think you're right. As, as faithful people, we have to let God transform us first before God can use us to transform the world or, or even in the midst. I think God, God uses us and changes us all at the same time. Yeah. We're never going back to normal, um, which might be good, right? What the old normal was, we've seen lots of ways that that um, was broken and hurting a lot of people. What do you hope emerges from this? What kind of world and community do you hope in your wildest and best and sweetest dreams might emerge from this as we come out of this and in a new way? Yeah, um, well, I think um, you're right that there it's not going back to normal, but we're creating new normals. Um, and I think some of the things will include taking the things that we're learning and doing right now um, even when we don't think we might need them later to continue those practices because um, we're having to be creative right now and cr find creative ways to be church. Um, and it's meeting a need because we all need it because we're all apart from each other. But um, no matter what time it is, there's always people who are unable to participate in the life of the church because they aren't able to make it into um, away from their home or even visitors or new people could be reluctant to come visit. Um, but having our services online allows that um, and allows us to be even more open. So carrying the creative things we're doing now with us, even when we're able to be back together and there's a vaccine and how far away that is. But um, the other things about create, um, creating new normals, um, I, take a, I, I keep having flashbacks because before serving the church here in Arizona, I was a pastor in Kentucky at First Christian Church of Owensboro. And the reason I keep having flashbacks to that um, experience of being a minister there is that we, um, while I was there, our church was struck by lightning and completely destroyed by fire. And so um, it was a crisis, there was a crisis and I'm seeing a lot of parallels. It's very different than this crisis, but that the same kind of path or journey where the at, when it first happens, there's this, um, really like honeymoon moment of people coming out of the woodwork and people showing up for one another and um, just the world kind of the seeing the best in the world. But that period doesn't last forever. 
Um, and we are noticing that now because we are seeing the ugliness of division in our world and how we're so divided on what we think the, our world should be shaped like, whether you wear a mask or you don't, or where you should go or who you sh where you shouldn't go. Um, but the reason I'm thinking about that for this question is that um, there were priorities that the church there decided. Um, for instance, they decided to, when they settled with the insurance and got the money from the total church loss, they decided to take a portion of that to start an endowment that would see um, ministry opportunity, ministry that would fund um, outreach and mission and service opportunities and that would impact their community. Um, they could have spent that money in building the sanctuary just a little bigger, or putting a little more things in it, but they decided to take a portion of that um, to so that they could um, live into that later. And so I'm hopeful that the things that we're seeing more clearly now, how we're gaining insights and vision are the things that we'll carry with us into the next season of our life as church. Um, and um, working together to um, make a difference in the ways that um, just, uh, I'm trying to think about, how, or what I'm trying to say is um, how we're kind of mindful now of all the, the cracks in our society and the um, brokenness and um, making sure we keep a vision for that and eyes for that to keep uh, making space in our mission and our budget and our um, call as church to as people of faith to respond to. I love the, the kind of artist look you you offer us of inviting us to think about how we see and what we see in the world and what this has shown us to see. That's not the way I typically think and so that's been really powerful and helpful to me and I hope to some of you all listening too of how what we're seeing differently now and how we can keep that kind of artist creative eye when we when we help to recreate what's next um keep seeing those pieces what word of encouragement do you have for faithful people today for us gathered i mean this is a this is not easy for anyone um we're all you know ben said we're all in the same storm but in different boats so some of us many of us are having an easier time than others um but it's not easy for anyone. Um, so what, what word of encouragement do you have for faithful people today? Um, the word of encouragement I would have is I would encourage people to tap into their creative, um, their creativity, whether that's um, whatever, however through the arts that is, whether that's through visual arts or music or theatrical or storytelling. Um, and just like prayer, there, it might be the thing that we think we never have enough time for, but um, it's the thing that we need. I, um, I, I think it's Mo Willems I saw recently, the children's book uh -huh. author, in Illustrator. Um, he wrote somewhere, I think just recently, it said, um, science will get us um, out of this, but art will get us through. Amen. Um, I love that, how it's, it's not an either or, but a both and, and how often we can forget um, our creative side or think we don't have enough time for it, but seeing it as a part of our um, important part of our faith, thinking of God as a creator and how if we bear God's image, we too are creators. Amen. Yeah. Well, I, there's a quote, I shouldn't say it here because I can't remember who it's from or exactly how it goes, but, uh, but I remember there's a quote that says, you know, every day you should pray for at least 30 minutes, except for days when you're really busy and those days you should pray for an hour. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's right. I think what you're saying with art, that the times we think we don't have time for prayer, we don't have time to create, that's when we need it the most mm -hmm. and need to spend more time on those things. I think you're exactly right. What's giving you life these days? Where are you finding joy in life and open this time for yourself? Yeah, um, the thing that's giving me life I get at this moment is um, we, so I already mentioned I love my house plants, but um, recently we, because of this time, um, we something that we wouldn't have done, I think, otherwise if we didn't have this time is um, we've started gardening and uh, we've made some raised beds with some free pallets we found. And um, about a, couple, a week ago was when we first planted the seeds and we had a 
do a lot of research because this is not the perfect growing time. The growing season here is so different than it is other places of the country because we live in the desert, but we picked ones that would work for the desert and um, seeing them sprout this week has been giving me a lot of life and seeing the resiliency of nature about how when, when we feel like the world has stopped or the things, the, our rhythms have stopped that um, the world hasn't and that creation hasn't. Oh, I love that. Also, I'm really impressed you're growing anything in 108 degrees. Yeah. You're a gardening hero. Um, well, we got I, one I, I, kept so the, I kept saying we language in that, um, but if Frank, my husband, were to watch this, he uh, would know that um, it's all him. <laughs> Way to go, Frank. Gardening <laughs> hero. <laughs> Uh, we got one question here from Carla Carsey, and if other folks have questions, if you want to put them in the chat or in the comment box, um, but Carla asks, how do you come up with what you want to paint and draw? Oh, good. So um, I always look at the left with the, so um, speaking of being accountable, so a, last year for 2019, I said, I'm going to paint an image based on the lectionary every single Sunday. Um, and I did that for like four Sundays, and then I stopped, and then I picked it back up, and then I stopped. Um, but then I wanted it as a goal again for 2020 and I put it out there to other churches and originally was one of the first churches. And now I have, I think there's about like 35 churches that use my art for the covers or for their worship slides. Um, and so I start by looking at the text and I always try to pull out an image from the text. Um, I don't always try to recreate the scene or, and think about, okay, if it's a story about Jesus and the disciples, I'm going to paint the figures because, um, for my, as when I create, I have to be able to see what I'm painting. I don't, mm. I'm, I'm always impressed with people who can draw or paint things just out of their imaginations. I am not that. Um, so I always, throw, so I grabbed some just to look at, but um, I'm trying to think of some, but so I guess, let's see. so um, I think this was a sun, Sunday before last yeah. and it was three of, um, I, I can't remember, but oh, about Jesus saying that he's going to um, be leaving, but that we're going to receive this advocate, this Holy Spirit. And so I was trying to think of the way to um, illustrate the Holy Spirit and how many times the Holy Spirit is likened to the wind. And so then I ended up finding an image that to me um, indicated that with a um, marigold and the, when you blow the marigolds um, is, goes everywhere and is blowing in the wind um i loved that one and i remember when you did that one because i you always see stuff in the scripture that i don't see and so i love getting to see your art after i've kind of read and thought on the scripture hello fabulous <laughs> after i've read and it. thought on the scripture all week to get to see your art it always draws something out differently than i had noticed yeah and it's, it definitely changed the way i preach like i know i i look at it for or i look at the um scripture for what image or what thing that I'm going to create. And then because of that, then it shapes the way I approach the sermon too. Hi, fabulous girls. I'm glad y'all see you. <laughs> you we say love hi? you and your mama. Yeah. Um, let's see, Mark or Catherine, do we have any more questions coming in? Or if you have more questions, if you want to share those with us. Let's see. Oh, I see another one. Becca, what's your favorite thing to paint? My favorite thing to paint? Um, and that's from Sarah Almanza. Yeah. Um, my favorite thing to paint is anything that has a reflection, like glass or metal, um, because it really is an activity of having to pay attention to where, because colors change. And um, so one Sunday I took a picture. And so it's, my favorite thing to paint actually is just kind of looking through my everyday life and trying to notice things that my eye is drawn towards um, and not like going driving out to try find the perfect sunset, but to find those um, items or those objects, but looking at them in a new way. So I, so this is a painting I painted of um, the communion trays and I was sitting um, on the front row of our church that Sunday and noticed the, um, all the reflections and all, how all the colors changed and danced with it. So that would be my favorite thing to paint. Is anything with a, refle a reflection or um, glassware, something like that. You are so incredibly talented. Any other questions for Becca? That's all I see right now. 
Becca, thank you for being here with us. More than that, though, thank you for your ministry. Your your art and your ministry is really a gift to the church and and to us. And your art helps us to kind of see God in in new ways each week. And your insights on how art guides us in faith have been beautiful. So thank you for that. And thank you, Chloe and Phoebe, for sharing your mama with us for just a little bit. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you all who have, have watched with us tonight and have listened to Becca's wisdom ways that you are, are seeking to be and are being God's people in the world today and seeking out for, for God's creation and creating in new ways around us. So thank you for that. So bye, Becca. Thanks for being well, with us. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your ministry and to Ridgely for um, all the work you'll do as um, faithful people and as a church. And I'm grateful to um, be in this together with y'all. <laughs> Absolutely. And I am glad to know, you know, see others parenting and pastoring at the same time. That is a, a new gift I have learned in this time, and I'm grateful for it. Yes. <laughs> so have a great night, everybody. Thanks for being with us. All right. Thank you. Bye.